It is my pleasure to introduce Matt Segal. Um, I remember when I first came to PCC, Matt was a kind of larger than life figure for me. I was very much in awe of, of his intellect and I'm still in awe of him, but these days I'm more in awe of his humanity. And I think Matt is doing very well, something that we're all trying to do here to carry these two poles of the mind and the heart. And I'm really grateful and appreciative to have Matt as a friend and to have him as an example in this world of a way that we can try to carry the head and the heart together. And let's welcome Matt. Introductions are so heartfelt and sentimental. Just, it's hard to think afterwards, but we'll try. So it's really exciting to be able to present in front of all of you. I think there's a, um, a space of possibility that opens up for me that I've had to cultivate um, by forcing myself to do as many public speaking um, events as possible. Um, to the point where it becomes exciting because thinking out loud in front of a captive audience really allows my mind to expand and it's, it allows me to start to develop um, new concepts but concepts to find um, as common fields of feeling we get to feel into these new conceptual spaces together even if you're just out there not in your head it helps me reach towards some common conceptual structure that we're creating together. So I really value this time. Thank you for listening. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes, hopefully less because I want to actually hear from you and not just hear uh, see shaking heads, um, is lay out what will become the first chapter of my dissertation. And um, we're going to meet um, a very important thinker who you might say is the guardian of the threshold, um, so I think of him anyways, Immanuel Kant. Is his name any Kantians in the audience? Yeah, everyone? All right, I wasn't expecting too many, but you know, in studying Kant deeply and you can keep going deeper and discovering new things, um, my respect for him has increased. and. Uh, even if he does represent this sort of Saturnian um, limitation, preventing me from wanting, uh, from being able to articulate and speculate about, you know, the cosmos at large, the nature of the human psyche, the nature of the divine. Even if Kant seems to stand in the way of, of speculating about those ideas, um, he seems to sharpen uh, my ability to avoid deluding myself and thinking I have knowledge of those things when really I don't. Um, so we really, uh, I think, need to um, pay respects to this person. And, you know, all of the, if philosophy is a wisdom tradition and there are these figures that it's so easy to critique because we've seen the crystallization of the worldview that, that they first articulated as ideas that then they became our world and we obviously want to change this world and it's easy to blame them for having created this world but unless we fully understand the ideas that went into creating this world we can't change it so um, so Kant um, he articulated uh, what he called a transcendental method which was a critique of all metaphysics that came prior to him and as far as he was concerned, there really was no philosophical knowledge prior to him. It was all just um, what he called transcendental illusions. Um, people were speculating about the nature of the universe just based on, um, well, really, Aristotle. They were reading it in a book, and, and you know the way that Aristotle broke down the structure of the Greek language logically 
um, he just assumed that the structure of our thought linguistically was mirrored by the structure of being. And so there's no need to, you know, go um, test our intuitions and experiment. Um, we could just assume that our mind is directly linked up to the structure of being. And what Kant pointed out is that our mind is actively constructing our experience. And right at the very beginning of his first major book, um, well, he, he published before, but the first his world historical book, I think, is his critique of pure reason in 1781. Right at the beginning of that book, there are these 20 pages um, called The Transcendental Aesthetic. And in these 20 pages, Kant tries to articulate um, what, how the mind generates um, the sort of stage upon which um, all the objects of our experience are, are dancing. And that stage is, is constructed in terms of space and time. And for Kant, our experience of space and time um, are again, uh, he called them forms of intuition that are constructed by our mind. His little phrase is that space and time are empirically real in that we all experience them in, you know, he thought, an identical way, that there, there's a universal we, we share universally, all human beings, the same basic structure of space and time. Um, they're empirically real in that sense, experientially real. But they're transcendentally ideal, which is to say that what reality is independent of our mind's activity and our mind's construction of the spatio-temporal uh, stage that we experience uh, the world upon, what the world is independent of that, we, have, we can't say, we don't know. We don't know. We only know the world in terms of space and time. Um, there could be, Kant speculated, um, alien intelligences on other planets that have different forms of intuition, totally different experiences of space and time. And, you know, we have no access to that. We only have access to the spatio-temporal stage that our mind constructs for us. So right off the bat, we're limited in our knowledge of reality. Really, we don't have knowledge of reality. And Kant's whole project was to say, well, what, what can we have knowledge of then? Well, we can have knowledge of our own process of knowing. We can turn the speculative gaze back upon our own thinking and discover what is necessary um, for our kind of thinking. We can discover the transcendental conditions that make possible our kind of experience. We can't know what lies beyond that experience in the world itself, but we can know a lot about how our mind generates this form of experience. And that leads to a whole sort of, of interesting speculations about um, uh, the nature of human freedom and uh, what it means that we can experience um, beauty in nature. And in, in Kant's last critique, the critique of judgment, he sort of um, opens up into the kind of thought that um, I'm trying to move into in my dissertation. And there, there's a series of post-Kantian thinkers, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, the most famous among them, who found an opening, a crack in the, 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 um, the, the wall that Kant built, keeping us from penetrating to the nature of reality that had to do with aesthetics and had to do with the nature of our experience of beauty um, when when we behold the, the natural world around us. Um, and in my dissertation, uh, I'm building on Whitehead and Schelling, one of those post-Kantian thinkers, um, to try to you know, spell out in a more contemporary language, because I think you know, Schelling did a pretty good job spelling this out himself, and as did Whitehead. But I want to try to you know, inject some sort of poetic um, I want to re-perform the insights that they discovered in a way that I think uh, the ears of our time can hear, perhaps. So in, the, in, in Whitehead's most famous book, Process and Reality, he says something interesting about these 20 pages, the transcendental aesthetic. Um, 
I'll read you what he says. He says, the philosophy of organism, which is how Whitehead describes his own ontology, his own speculative philosophy, the philosophy of organism aspires to construct a critique of pure feeling in the philosophical position in which Kant put his critique of pure reason. So Whitehead wants to replace the critique of pure reason with the critique of pure feeling. He goes on, thus, oh sorry, he says, this should also supersede the critique of pure feeling, should supersede the remaining critiques required in the Kantian philosophy, the uh, critique of practical reason and the critique of judgment were these other critiques that Kant articulated. Whitehead thought they weren't necessary at all. Um, if we, instead of focusing on how thought constructs the world, we start maybe not just thinking about, but feeling into how the world is constructed by emotional vectors, feelings of causal inheritance from the world around us. What if perception is direct and immediate, the immediate inheritance of the emotional uh, dynamics of the beings in our environment, instead of um, being a construction of our cognitive apparatus, right? So it's sort of like a bottom-up understanding of perception, experience, and knowledge, rather than a top-down sort of um, um, intellectual understanding of the construction of experience. So critique of pure feeling would replace the rest of the Kantian critiques. So then Whitehead says, um, Thus, in the organic philosophy, Kant's transcendental aesthetic becomes a distorted fragment of what should have been his main topic. So, 600 page book, Critique of Pure Reason, 20 pages. Um, that he really should have maybe un un unpacked a bit more. Um, so what would it mean to unpack this a little bit? Uh, if, we just, if we just think about space and time as they arise for us um, in our, our feelings of them. Uh, if we want to try to access the, the most concrete um, you know, meaning of space and time, one way we could do that is to just refer to, in terms of the most concrete form of space, well, here, here we are. The most concrete form of time, now. But as soon as I say that, here, now, you know, time has kept going, the planets moved through its, around the sun and its orbit. So the here and now that I was trying to point you to a few moments ago is no longer the same here and now that I'm trying to point you to here and now, you know? So these words here and now that seem so particular, concrete, focused, and specific actually are pretty abstract. They refer to any here and now. And this is, this is uh, a sort of dialectical uh, maneuver that Hegel leads us through, where he, he shows how an empiricist thinks that what they think is most concrete and present is actually pretty abstract. The here and now is not as concrete as it at first appears to be. So that's not going to work to get at space and time. Um, we can't get at them empirically, right? So maybe if we try a cosmological approach to this, like going back to Plato. Plato thought of um, space and time. Um, space for him was what he called the cora. Um, it's sometimes translated as the receptacle. It's sort of the, um, the, the medium that holds all forms. It's, it's the, the sort of etheric space of possibility that allows for actuality. Um, and so it's abstract, but there's a little bit more of a, of a, um, you know, a feeling that you can get for what it would mean to swim in the Cora. Um, it holds us. Whitehead refer, or Plato refers to it as the wet nurse of all becoming. It gives birth to form, eternal form in, in, in the spatio-temporal world of becoming. Um, it, it, it. It's the nurturing mother that allows the forms to survive, to, to flower within the, the visible material world. It's the Cora. Um, and in terms of time, Plato would, would point us to the heavens, to the sky, and say that time is brought forth by the, the musical, rhythmic motions of, of the heavens. Um, 
So the time becomes something you can almost see. It takes a little bit of imagination to see the motion of the planets um, night after night moving through a harmonious rhythmical pattern. Um, but it's still, you know, Plato's sense of space and time as the cora and the sky, basically. It starts to be a little bit more concrete. Um, but for, for Kant, what he was trying to point to draw, to draw our attention to is that um, whether we're talking about the here and now or we're talking about the, the cora and the sky, um, our understanding of those those ideas, those ways of getting at the meaning of space and time are all based on, um, we learn about them through experience. They're empirical in that sense. And he wanted to try to articulate what space and time were transcendentally. In other words, what can we know about space and time prior to any experience of the sky and the motion of the planets or of um, any specific moments here and now? What can we know about space and time prior to that? And you know, 